Hi, everybody. We have special guests. You see her right there. It's Sally Boyton Brown. Now, she was the executive director or is the executive director of the Idaho State Democratic Party. She founded WeTheDNC.org. Uh, you might know her. She's best known. She's known to me because I saw her at the debate. She ran for the DNC chair. She came. She had the third uh, highest amount of vote totals. Correct. Was that? That's right. OK. Yep. And you Super and you. Proud. And you are also the executive director of a new organization that I just became aware of. Tell me what that is, the National... The, uh, so it's the Association, uh, National Association of State Democratic Executive Directors, the ASDED. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a... I love it's a this. mouthful. Yeah, it's a <laughs> mouthful. Now, you, you know, when you founded WeTheDNC.org, I went to that website and you, uh, you talk, you, you talk, tell me, what do you think the problem with the Democratic Party is? So I, when I decided to run for chair, it was really important to me to show in every action and word that I believed that the, the issue that we're facing as a nation is not about any one person, that it's not about any one leader. And so I chose to call my organization We the DNC because I really wanted to show that it was going to take all of us coming together to fix this problem. Um, I clearly have you know, ideas about how we fix things um, and we'll continue to move forward doing that. However, none of us get to sit back and just criticize and, and not be a part of the solution. If we're not part of the solution, then we're part of the problem. Okay, and what are some of your solutions? Uh, so one of the things that I've been uh, actively working on is making sure that we pull all voices into the conversation um, around how we fix the party, how we fix uh, our organization, and how we fix our country. Um, I really focus on in my campaign that we can't, um, alienate any voice from the conversation. It's We can't afford to kick anybody out. It really is getting comfortable with conflict and getting comfortable with uh, this concept of civil discourse that I think we've really lost in our country. So I spent quite a bit of time uh, on social media specifically really having conversations with people I disagree with. So you say that uh, the Democratic Party is not responsive to its members or to the public. What do you mean when you say that? I think that for a long time, the DNC has been overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have to do and uh, have not set up the type of infrastructure that they need to really be having two-way conversations with its members. And, you know, I've been really pleased with what I've seen from uh, Chairman Perez's and uh, Deputy Chair uh, Ellison's leadership so far. They've started the Facebook Live events, um, you know, really being able to hear from people. They're traveling the country right now. Um, I'm sure hearing from a diverse group of opinions. So wait a minute, Sally, you, you're saying that the problem with the DNC, when you say they're not responsive to the public or to the or its members, you mean that they're overworked? Is that what I heard you say? Uh, well, two things. I do think that they've been overworked. I also think that the reality is, is there's been no process set up in in place to really hear from the public. Um, they haven't put anything institutionally inside that building that has set up a system of customer service response. Okay, so that, you know, wouldn't that be like, a, the, the, I would think that the elections and the fact that the Democratic Party has been wiped out from coast to coast at every level of government, state, Congress, Senate, White House, isn't that a very big, loud message to the DNC? I mean, I think that would be the feedback. What other feedback would they want to hear? Their message isn't isn't landing with the people it's supposed to be landing with. And a lot of people say the problem with the Democratic Party isn't that there isn't a mechanism for people to hear what the people have to say. The Democratic National Committee knows exactly what Bernie Sanders' message is. They know exactly what the progressives want. They don't want it. They're in bed with Wall Street. And once the Democratic Party got in bed with Wall Street, they are now diametrically opposed to the workers in America, which is why they're wiped out at every level of government. So do you really think that the prescription is more listening do they what do they need to know so uh, I just want to point out that I didn't say listening what I said was <laughs> two-way conversations okay. Uh, okay I think that based on everything that I saw while I was on the road with the 11 candidates we had running I think that the leaders in our party and based on everything that I've seen in this transition so far the leaders in our party uh, have gotten the message loud and clear that things aren't working I do think that we what, need what, what would be a sign that they got the message? Because every sign I see is the opposite. They did not allow a progressive to take over the DNC. In fact, they took a vote to keep taking corporate and lobbyist money right before they shafted the progressive. So what would be the signal that the DNC is getting it? 
I think it's actually a great sign that the very first thing that Tom Perez did was put in uh, Keith Ellison as deputy chair and has given him a significant role in that transition. And I think it's a very clear sign that he's listening to the progressive movement by going on the road with Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders absolutely is not going to allow himself to be a patsy. He would not have gone on the road with Tom if he didn't think that there was some uh, type of change on the horizon. Okay. All right. So you so what so again your prescription is just more two-way conversations with the democratic base and see i think my problem is that the you can only stick the thumb in the eye of progressives so long before they get you know it's it's too much it's an abusive relationship between the democratic party and actual so when the democratic party got in bed with the wall street and the democrat the democratic leadership council with bill clinton and al gore and they took fund and you know there was Koch brother executives on the board of that organization. And that's what really turned the Democratic Party into a Republican Party, which is why there's real the, the people don't come out to vote for the Democrats, why Hillary lost to to uh, Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump was inevitable. These aren't my ideas. Lots of people have said this stuff. So I really I, I saw you when at the de, at the debate and we really were big fans of yours. And I like that you want to you, you focus on the other half of the electorate that isn't coming out to vote. What is your, do you have any, which I think is important, uh, do you have any, what are some specific ideas to get the half of the electorate that's not coming out to vote to get them out? Well, I think, first of all, we have to be talking to them. Um, I I have a degree in communication, so a lot of what you're going to hear me talk about is setting up infrastructure to talk to people. Right now, uh, we've been running campaigns that frankly don't focus on talking to folks who aren't voting, we focus on people who are voting. Until we start having conversations with them, we're not ever gonna be able to persuade them to vote, let alone vote for us. So we've gotta have the technology uh, and database infrastructure in place to go find those people and have those conversations. I would also love to see some polling. It shocks me that you look at the turnout for the election that we had this year, and not a single pundit or pollster after the election was having conversations with those people who chose to stay home and not vote for either of our presidential candidates. So uh, a theme on our show is is that we've noticed uh, since the election that when people go to town halls and they confront their Democratic representatives and they ask them, what do Democrats stand for? They can only give uh, a litany of platitudes. Uh, Tom Perez also is, uh, falls into that same trap they don't think uh, bernie sanders uh, immediately knows what he stands for and that's i think the big difference right now between republicans and democrats is you can wake a republican out of a sound sleep at four in the morning and they'll tell you what they're for they're for less government regulation less tax cuts <laughs> and uh, so but the democrats they always seem mealy mouthed around progressive platforms like single payer which is overwhelmingly popular nancy pelosi won't even say the words so what is it that you're offering that 50 percent of the electorate that doesn't vote right now. What is it that the Democratic Party stands for and what do you offer them? Well, listen, I'm not an elected official and I don't I've never had a conversation with Nancy Pelosi or, you know, really very many of our congressional folks at all. Um, so, uh, you know, my recommendation has been and will continue to be that we have to create message discipline within the Democratic Party. We have to get really clear about who we are, what we stand for, and we need to start communicating that. And not just our congressional uh, members. We need to make sure that every single Democrat knows exactly that message the way that uh, every single Republican does. In fact, I was sitting in our transition, our advisory transition committee meeting, and I said, I think that they get their talking points piped into their dreams at night. I mean, we've got to get to a place where... We agree, and I think, unfortunately, in order to get through that, we're gonna have to disagree, and that's the phase I think that we're in right now, is we, you you said earlier that you feel like uh, there's people trying to keep progressives out. I actually see that there was, in 2016, active people trying to keep progressives out. I think there are a lot of people inside the system, a lot of establishment people, who are now actively saying, okay, we did the wrong thing, we need to do something different and working to get them in. I work really closely with the Dem Enter movement, and I am super excited about the number of progressives who've been elected to uh, different uh, state party seats around the country, whether that's state chair, state vice chair, county chair, precinct captain. There's a huge movement of progressives taking this party over, and I'm excited to see where it takes us. So when you say that you, you think it's important that the Democrats all get, have message discipline, what would that message be? I think that for me, 
it would be that Democrats are here to help people. And that's what we do every single day is try to lift the people of our country up and give everybody a fair shake. So I think, uh, you know, I am an organizational development person. I am about the process. I am about making sure that the Democratic Party is practicing good uh, principles of democracy and making sure that we're communicating to people how you get inside the party, um, either to run for office or to run for uh, party leadership. And then I count on policy people to, to take the policies and craft them from there. I think there's a lot of, of good people doing good work, and we've got to get better at uh, the principles of democracy, frankly, making sure that we're not trying to control the process and that we let people control the process. So is the reason why you can't, uh, you're not giving me uh, what the message should be, is the reason why, because you're not a policy person in the demo, you're more of an organizer, is that why? Well, the reason that I'm a Democrat is because Democrats help people and we help every everybody achieve equality. So that's my message. I don't know if that's the same message that every Democrat. But that sounds like something that anybody could say. That doesn't sound like a progressive message. That sounds exactly like something a Republican could say. So what would be uniquely uh, Democratic about the message? So, I mean, I guess we're falling into this and right now in this interview. We're falling into that same problem. I keep asking you what your message is and you keep giving me platitudes. And I keep well, asking you, is the reason you're giving me platitudes, is it because you're not a policy person and you're an organization person? So why is it that I'm only getting platitudes? Jimmy, I don't I don't know why you don't like my answer. I can't change my answer for you. <laughs> OK, but the reality is, is that's why I'm a Democrat. And so that's my message. I, I you might have a different answer. I, I can't. I mean, all I can I'm not giving you platitudes. I'm just giving you my answer. So okay. I can't help. You. Sorry. OK, well, Sally, I appreciate you coming on. I really am urging the Democratic Party to have an actual platform to actually have programs that would actually help people and get them excited, like single payer, free college uh, infrastructure, ending the wars, reinvesting that money back here, breaking the Democratic Party's tie to Wall Street and Big Pharma and Silicon Valley, returning to their roots and uh, embracing unions and workers, maybe come out for card checks. So there's a million things that they could say that the Democrats aren't saying and that you aren't saying right now. And I wish you would say. I wish the Democrats would also say that those are what uh, gets thousands of people out to see Bernie Sanders talk. If you remember, once he stopped talking about that and started uh, giving people platitudes in, in the support of Hillary Clinton, he couldn't get 100 people to show up to hear him talk in Iowa. So uh, I urge you to urge everybody inside the Democratic Party to try to come up with real platforms, real policies that will change people's lives, that will make them excited about voting. Because those platitudes we're hearing, you can hear them from, that, that's not a Democratic message. That's anybody's message. Everybody's for equal treatment, fair pay, better jobs, uh, you know, all that stuff. So I in, really encourage the Democrats to kind of, to, to realize that they're wiped out right now and that this kind of platitude feeding the, the, the electorate isn't working. And that was what does excite the electorate is to actually have uh, policies that affect people's lives. So I agree. I mean, I'm we're all on the same side. I'm a progressive. It sounds like you're a progressive. And if you want to get those half of people that don't come out to vote in the country, you got to give them something to come out to vote for, because just not being Donald Trump isn't doing it. And saying that we're for everybody and good jobs is also just empty rhetoric. So I'll give you the last word. What, what would you like to say to everybody as you say goodbye? Well, I would just say that I agree uh, that all of the policies that you just, uh, you know, kind of uh, took time to talk about are all good policies. There's sometimes we don't have three minutes to have the conversation about the policies we agree on. I do think we need to find a strong values-based message that's going to at least keep people's foot in the door. I'm not claiming to have the, the right message. I think that we need to come together to have a conversation about what that message is. And thankfully, there's much smarter people than I. I, I will say I am heartened that I, I believe I see more energy and more power around the type of policies that you're talking about um, than ever before. I know that Senator Sanders uh, and Chairman Perez are hitting the road to talk about a lot of those issues. Um, you know, I just was looking through that press release today. I will say as an organizational person and not a policy person, um, I will be interested to kind of see where our, our country goes next. Um, because I think that a lot of the 50% of the folks who aren't voting don't take time to think about policy. Um, and so I do think we need to have a conversation about how you take the policy and craft it into a story that maybe is a little bit more easily consumable for folks. 
again, for me, it's more about let's make sure that we're having the hard conversations and creating space for that than it is about like, I've got the answer. I'm going to save the world. I will continue to be a part of the process. And I think we all should continue to be a part of the process because God knows our country needs saving. Well, Sally, I applaud your efforts for trying to reach out to the uh, half of the country that doesn't participate in the elections. I think you're the only one I've really heard talk about it. So a a tip of the hat to you for doing that. I think it's really important. I think that's the, you know, you got to grow the party that way. And, you you know, I think uh, as it's been proven over and over by polls, that Americans are progressive on the issues. Uh, when you ask them about the issues, people are for progressive policies. And I think, uh, you know, I hope that uh, you, you have those tough conversations and I hope that we can have a clearer message going forward. And I wish you all the luck in the world. Thanks for coming on, Sally. Thanks, Jimmy. I really appreciate the opportunity. Have a great rest of your afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. Hey, our next live Jimmy Dore show is April 24th, April 24th, live in Burbank. We do two shows a month, live shows. So get your tickets right down there, JimmyDoreComedy.com.